What's up, folks? This is Jean-Claude with Detailed Designs Auto Spa. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. As you can see, we've got a bunch of camera stuff here and lighting and audio and we have tripods and gimbals and have a lot of stuff that um, over the years, if you go back through our, our video history, you'll see that some of our older content is quite frankly a little cringeworthy. It's pretty bad stuff and even to this day, you know, I, I don't know about you, but you know, whether it's a video or it's a car, I really feel like even as relatively good as it may come out, I just feel like it could always just be a little bit better. So I know that some of this stuff when it comes to shooting video, shooting pictures can be intimidating because I remember being there where I didn't know anything, nothing, literally. Um, I remember my first digital SLR was, I think, uh, I think I went to Walmart, not Walmart, Best Buy, and bought a, it's either a T2 or T3i Rebel, and had no idea what I was getting. But it was a great start because it allowed me to start to take manual photo or photographs in manual settings. So that meant I could um, I could adjust the parameters of the digital camera so that, um, for instance, one of the things a lot of people like is when you've got a really shallow depth of field in a photograph or even a video. And you get that by adjusting the aperture of the camera. So if you've got an aperture of, say, 1.4, then what you're going to have is uh, the closer you are to the subject, you're going to have a very shallow depth of field and everything behind it's going to get real blown out. So I'm shooting at f 2.8 right now and you can, you can see the outline of some stuff happening back here, but it's not super crisp and in focus. And if I wanted that, then I would increase it. Bottom line is um, starting to shoot manual is one of the best things that you can do. And there's so much information available with YouTube, uh, websites, and sometimes uh, depending on how you compute information, watching a video may be better for you, or maybe sitting down and, and reading through a technical article. You know, it kind of depends on how you uh, consume information. I'm the kind of guy, I like to get all of it. I like to read the content, I like to watch the video, I like to watch the reviews, and I feel like the more synapses I can create, the better I can absorb the information because the stuff can be pretty in-depth. So it's really late right now. I did not intend on shooting any videos today. So not to sound vain, but I know I look like a little bit of a hot mess and the shop's a little messy, and you may end up, depending on how many cuts I can get through this video, and you may see the infrared lamp move so I'm here late because I'm waiting for this Macan GTS for us to finish uh, hitting it with the infrared lamps. So there's no shortcuts to that. It just sometimes I get to stay late. Anyways, um, so what I'm going to cover is uh, the kind of the really what's going to get somebody who may not know much about photography or videography. Hopefully, after watching this video or this series of videos, depending on kind of how it goes. Uh, hopefully you can watch it and feel much more comfortable in making a decision in the path you go. Hopefully this saves you some money because I'm going to go over some stuff that quite frankly I blew the money. So uh, hopefully you can learn from my own mistakes. Now I will be including in the description down below, down there, I'll be including um, affiliate links. So if you like the stuff I go over, feel free to click on them and purchase them through my affiliate link. I'm not going to lie about it. I make a couple bucks on it. So if you spend a hundred dollars, I may get like two or three bucks or something like that. It's not a lot, but at any rate, every little bit helps to support keeping our doors open and, you know, creating content and the bigger success we can have there, the better the content we can create. At any rate, um, so let's start with the camera gear. 
my advice is get a digital SLR. Now you don't have to start shooting manual, but you should learn it. Once you learn to shoot manual, you'll probably find yourself shooting manual more often than you're going to find yourself shooting automatic. So for me, what I do is when I'm looking at a car, whether it's video um, or pictures I'm going to be taking, what I do is I focus on, I kind of have a vision for what I want that shot to look like. If I want the background completely blown out, like I want just one little thing in focus, whether I want everything in the picture, everything in the frame to be in focus because I feel like the whole frame or what you see in the image is telling a story. So, and that goes again for video or for photography. Now the great thing with the digital SLRs now is you can shoot some really great video and get great photographs from one single camera. Um, now you have mirrorless and you have mirror technology what's becoming more popular now is starting to get traction is this are mirrorless cameras so for a mirrorless camera you could go with uh, Panasonic Panasonic GH5 they just announced the GH5S which is uh, a camera system that's that's more focused on shooting video so its primary focus is video but it can shoot uh, photographs as well you could do the, what is it, the Sony A7, A7S or A7R2, I think. Um, that's another really great mirrorless camera system that also shoots video, uh, I'm sorry, pictures. Now, I have, um, I used to have a Canon and I decided to skip to Nikon. And what I'm shooting this video on right now is a Nikon D810. Now they just, uh, about maybe three or four months ago, came out with the D850, which I would like to upgrade to, but we just spent a bunch of money on some other stuff, and this camera's getting by, so we're gonna hold off on that. Plus, I'm kinda thinking we may end up go with the GH5S. But when you go with a camera, whether it's Nikon, Canon, Panasonic, Sony, they all have their own mounting system. So the mounting system is going to be essentially the means for that, that the lenses engage and disengage on the body of the camera. This would be called the body. This has the brain, may have a viewfinder or a LCD display. Um, and then you have your lens. Now a good rule of thumb is find the lenses you like and get a body that works with that. That's what most people talk about, but that's starting to change a little bit. Um, just because, for instance, Canon used to just be known as hands down, they had the best glass or lenses. That's not necessarily the case anymore. Nikon makes some, some, some fantastic glass. Uh, Panasonic, Sony. Sony, actually, if I remember right, they make a brand called Zeiss which is known to have, known to be some of the finest photograph, um, portrait glass made. Uh, it's really expensive. You can spend a lot of money on your glass. But, um, you know, the point is there's a lot of options available. Uh, do your research. My advice is look at the Nikons, look at the Canons, look at the Sony, look at the Panasonic. And yeah, there's some other manufacturers out there, but Again, the concept of this video is to hopefully kind of give you some bullet points to look for. And I'm not saying no other cameras are worth considering, but I can't give you advice on it. And with the bit of information I have, I would say focus on those. When you get your camera gear, protect it. That's really important. Um, don't be camera poor. You know, don't spend all your money on your gear and then you don't have a means to transport it or to uh, keep it protected. So for instance, this is a small Canon uh, EOS, 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 whatever, EOS M. Um, it's a small mirrorless camera that I got this one because I needed something very portable. Uh, the first thing I did was get a nice case for it. For my digital SLR, I have Let's see here, we're going to set some of this stuff out of the way here. Uh, 
All right, so I took the small mirrorless off and I forgot to bring this over initially. Um, there's one other thing to kind of talk about with your DSLRs, and that is do you go with full frame or cropped frame sensor? So your full frame is going to offer you, give me one second, that's a programmable light, and when it gets up to temp, it starts barking. So it's time to be moved anyways. All right, I apologize. Um, so on a full frame or cropped frame sensor, to go with a full frame body uh, means that essentially what you frame up, you're going to see more for the same um, lens. So let's say you're shooting with a 50 millimeter lens on a cropped frame sensor it's actually going to have a smaller area that you can see for that same lens as a full frame. Um, full frame is generally um, kind of more the professional direction. Uh, that's not to say you can't take incredible shots with a cropped frame sensor, but if you wanna start shooting uh, and getting the most out of your camera, then eventually you'll probably feel compelled to get a full frame camera. Uh, it is possible to get into a full frame camera without dropping a ton of money. Um, so the, the, when I got the D810, it was about $3,200 and now, the, and that's just the body, you get your glass on top of that. Um, to get the D850 is about $3,400 now. now that's got all the new gadgets and you can shoot with the D850, you can shoot 4K video at 30 frames per second. So um, it's going to be closer to the bleeding edge in terms of video. But if you wanna take photography, if you want your photographs, if you want to, I'm sorry, let's back that up. No, we're, 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 we're. Um, if you wanna shoot full frame for your photographs, you can hop in something like a Canon 5D from Craigslist for probably 400 bucks with possibly a lens. But you can get a 5D or whatever the equivalent of the Nikon was back then. And you can start collecting your glass and shooting pictures full frame. Um, because what can happen is if you get a cropped frame sensor, the same lenses don't necessarily work for full frame and cropped frame for say Nikon to Nikon or Canon to Canon, going from the cropped frame, crop sensor to the full frame. Um, so that's, again, kind of going back to when people talk about uh, buying for the glass and then getting a body to match. So hope that clears the air a little bit about that. So we were talking, I started to talk about the uh, protecting your equipment. Um, do you travel? Do you anticipate um, mainly shooting from one location? Uh, do you anticipate uh, making this a business expense? But if you happen to go out of town, I mean, why not use your gear? Um, if you're going to travel, you need to get a nice bag. Um, I like Manfrotto. They're kind of expensive, but I feel like the quality of the equipment that they make is really great. So, and you can wait for some of their gear to go on sale, but essentially, um, if you have, say, one of the smaller, uh, smaller body cameras, you can get by with, with uh, an adjustable lens um, and not necessarily have to have a full bag. Now, when I travel, I take this, it's loaded down, it's heavy because I take a lot of gear. I might be taking my audio equipment or some of my audio equipment. I can take hard drives, SSDs, um, memory cards, cameras. Uh, I'm sorry, cameras, of course cameras. Um, cell phones. Um, laptop, I can put my laptop in that bag. When it's loaded down, it's like a $10,000 bag full of gear. And that's nothing compared to what some of the professionals are carrying around, but you can see why it's so important to keep it protected. It's not inexpensive. And if, and if you're anything like me, you like to try to buy once and really make it work for you. 
it can't work for you if it's broken or if it breaks at a very inopportune time. So when it comes to your glass or your lenses, uh, you've got telephoto, you've got zoom, um, you've got um, the, uh, the prime glass or prime lenses. Your prime is where it's one set uh, length of glass, so say 50 millimeter or 32, and it will not adjust. The only thing you can adjust on it is your focal point. Um, but for a zoom lens, uh, you could go with something telephoto, you can do something wide angle. If you work on cars, if you're a detailer or you're in the automotive industry and you like to capture a lot of information inside a single picture, so if, if you feel like you, when you look at the pictures you take for an interior or an engine bay, you're like, man, it just, it doesn't look like the pictures I see in the magazines. Well, it's probably because you're not capturing enough of what's there. So when you get a wide angle lens, um, this is a Tokina 16 to 28 f 2.8 lens for my D810. Uh, so it can zoom from 16 millimeter to 28 millimeter. When it's on 16 millimeter, it captures a lot. Now, with these zoom lenses, it also tends to distort just a little bit. It's going to get a little bit of a fisheye. Um, but there's times that you want that look. But if I'm shooting an interior and I want to be able to show, hey, this is what we did to an interior. This is, this is the real feel for how this interior is. I'm not going to take a picture of like one little spot. I'm going to take a picture of a spot to maybe show a before and after of a defect or something that needed a lot of attention or our attention to detail. But if I wanted to be able to say, this is what an interior should look like then I'm taking a shot with this. If the car is outside and I want it to look, uh, I want that image to be really like super, super striking, then what I'm going to do is take one of my, uh, I think technically this falls under telephoto, uh, but it's 85 millimeter f1.4. So what that means is I can set my camera up put this lens on and take a shot that has, say the car is really crisp, but, and it captures a lot, almost like you're looking at something down a tunnel, right? You're not looking at a, at a portrait of a large landscape. It's almost like you're looking, you know, down a tunnel and you see one focal thing, one focal item. We'll call it, we'll say that. Um, that's where a lens like this comes in really handy. Uh, what this is not super good at, actually it's not good at it at all, is if you want to shoot video, moving video. So whether it's on a gimbal or a slider or you're panning somehow, if you're moving the camera at all, it's difficult to shoot video on this because, again, it's like down a tunnel. And imagine, imagine you're holding a, a, a broom by the tip of the broom and you're trying to hold the tip up. So it's going to shake a little bit. Well, when you're shooting anything with this, and um, like video, uh, it's kind of like holding something heavy and long, and it, it moves a little bit. So if you've got it on a tripod, on a very secure tripod, and it doesn't move, that's fine. But if it's moving, it's not going to work as good for that. I am shooting uh, this video on what's called a Sigma... 35 millimeter to f1.4 art lens. Uh, so when paired up with this body, it's one of the sharpest lenses money can buy. Uh, there are some that will edge it out, but for the money, it can't be beat. Sigma Art, uh, specifically when it comes to their prime lenses, is phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Uh, not inexpensive. But big picture, if you're kind of playing that game anyways, uh, you get a really great value from those. So when it comes to shooting video, um, there's a couple areas that most people 
uh, don't really give quite as good attention to. Um, I'll tell you what, let me move some of this stuff off and then I'll be right back and I'm probably gonna need to move some stuff around too. So hang on just one moment. All right. So two things that a lot of people, I won't say they miss. I, you know what I think it is, is I think a lot of people don't recognize how important they are when it comes to video. Two things, audio and lighting. So we'll start with audio first. If you go back in my videos and you capture any of the, <laughs> watch any of them that um, have me talking or have um, any noise that you're supposed to hear, you'll notice it sounds like trash. The reason is, is because I was recording off of the built-in microphone on cameras which historically are garbage. So there are, in my opinion, for the, the non-full-time video production crew, there are probably two styles of microphone that are going to be the best fit. The first is a shotgun style mic. So this is a shotgun style mic by Sennheiser. The exact model I cannot recall but there will be a link to it. Oh, I'm sorry here. It's the Sennheiser MKE 400. Uh, it's battery powered. You will need an auxiliary microphone input, uh, 3.5 millimeter jack to be able to use it with your camera. And I believe these can even be, if you've got that 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, I think it might work for cell phone cameras too double check but I know some people have used them for cell phones uh, it's going to be again battery powered so it's basically its own unit it's not an afterthought now the limitation with these microphones is as you get further away they don't work quite as good and it can also pick up a lot of noise in the uh, space whether it's a car driving by or uh, something flying overhead or just even even noises. See, I keep turning around because I'm, I'm hearing stuff and you probably aren't picking it up because what I'm speaking on is called a lave mic, lav mic, it's LAV mic. Um, not a hundred, I, I, I've heard people call it both things. I like to call it a lav mic. But anyways, I, I'm using a wireless lav mic. So this is my lav mic. This is, a, this is actually a two-channel lav mic. And what that means is there is a unit, and a, a receiver that plugs in just like, whoops, I turned on the Sennheiser. It plugs in with a 3.5 millimeter jack into the microphone port in the camera. Um, and this transmits everything coming from this mic, and I apologize if there's additional noise, but I run the mic down through my shirt. Um, and these tend to give you really great audio to work with. Um, and if you have a two channel, what that means is, let's say you're interviewing somebody, which I don't have any of those videos up right now, but I've got plans in the very near future to interview and share some stories with people. You can't do it with one la lav mic. So I have a two channel. It costs a little bit more um, to go with something like this. And this is a Ceramonic TX10. Uh, if I remember right, I wanna say we spent $450, $500 on this. But the quality of our audio um, dramatically improved. Uh, the other thing that a lot of people don't think about, and this can apply to photography as well, is lighting. Now, I've got to be honest, I haven't put quite as much into my lighting as I should to this point. Because I keep finding other really cool toys and buying that. 
those, um, but it's on my radar. Now, the lighting may seem pretty okay in this video, um, but there's what I realize when I'm setting up, the, the more I learn about photography and videography, primarily videography, because with photography, most of the time you can lengthen your exposure time, your, your lengthen the shutter speed and gather more light because most of the time you're not taking with what I do, you're not taking pictures of moving things. You're taking static images. So you could have the shutter open for a minute and nothing changes. It just lets more light in. So if you have poor lighting, you just lengthen your shutter speed. With video, it's not the same. You may have to crank up your ISO, which is like a digital version of increasing the exposure. Now, I'm sure I'm mangling what it really is, but um, if you have really great lighting, that means you don't have to digitally increase your exposure, which means you're going to have less artifacts and less noise on the video. Your image is going to be, uh, the image of the video is going to be crisper. It's going to be cleaner. It's going to be easier on the eyes. If you want to see a, a prime example of bad lighting, go to our video on how to remove clear brawl. The lighting was terrible, but the content was good enough that I said, well, I'll just put it out there. It'll probably fall through the cracks and never get views. And turns out it's up to like 40,000 views or something at this point, of course. But fortunately, the content was good enough that people find something salvageable about it. But when I look at it, I cringe because the audio sucked and the lighting sucked. That video could have been way better if I had better lighting, better audio. So there are a few different ways you can get better lighting. Um, one of the cheap things you can do is you can get one of these. Now this is called a shadow box. And the reason it's called a shadow box, I'm not really sure. <laughs> I know why it's called a box though, because it's kind of shaped like a box. But what you do is, let's see here. You're gonna put your light in it, and these are these are actually on Amazon. These are really cheap. I think you can get a couple of them, a set of two or three, and it's still under a hundred dollars. And it'll have these super cheap little tripods, which actually work pretty decent. They're not bad. If you're taking them down and putting them up every day as a professional, you would hate life because they're not built for that. But if you use it in a shop, it's really not too bad. But what it's going to do is, and you can put any kind of bulb in it you want. The brighter, almost the better for what we do. Um, put your bulb in it, and then you're going to put this little cover on. And what this is going to do is, let's turn this around here. So what this is going to do is it's going to give you really soft light. In a video, you, you want soft light most of the time. You don't want something really sharp and harsh because what you can end up with is, um, let's say you're using a little spotlight like the one right here. We do a lot of paint correction with these lights. But it's a, uh, let me tell you what it is. These bulbs are actually incredible for paint correction. It is a Utilitech Pro 23 watt, 1400 lumens um, spotlight, LED spotlight. And what we've done is we've taken photography um, bulb mounts and it screws right into the, the bulb mount. Screws right on top of the tripod. The most expensive thing here is the bulb. These bulbs are, are I think they're 45, 50 bucks a piece. Uh, if it breaks, if they break, we get another one. They're just, they're that awesome. It doesn't matter how much they cost. If these things were a hundred bucks, I'd be spending a hundred bucks a piece on them. They really are awesome for paint correction. They're great for um, 
setting it up and working on an interior, they put a lot of focused light out. But the problem is when you're doing a video, you don't necessarily want that focus light. You can't take this and put it in the light box and it makes it much softer and it breaks up that light. But, uh, you know, it's dependent on the situation. We have different types of lighting. The thing that we're going to be spending more money on here probably next week are light panels. So LED light panels that may have 100, 200, 500 individual LEDs. And then you can also put uh, something very similar to the light box. You can put a cover over it, some, or it's a diffuser is what it is. You can diffuse the lighting. Um, you can adjust the temperature. You can make it more of a tungsten temperature um, or tone where it's much softer. You can give it something that's much harsher if you want, something that would be more like natural sunlight. Um, but essentially, uh, their means for you to fine tune, you remember I was talking about the digital SLR and how you can fine tune the exact shot you want? You can do that with your lighting too. Now you can spend $50, 20 bucks on a cheap one. You could spend 2000 you could spend $5,000 on an expensive one. So it's kind of go as far as you feel comfortable to go. Um, like I said, this stuff gets really expensive. Um, choose your battles. So, keeping kind of with the theme of things most people don't think about a lot, um, your batteries. Get a lot of batteries because when you're working, if your battery goes out, specifically if you do this as a, if you're doing this to promote your services, you're a professional, you're an expert in your field, when things don't work, it costs you a lot of money. And that's why typically when I buy equipment, I don't buy for price. I buy for a solution because if my gear is not working and I've got two guys that I, that I said, hey, I need you to work with me and work a camera. Normally I have somebody working a camera with a video. And they're saying, cut, 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 that sounds like trash. Let's, you know, do it again, man, whatever. Oh, you misspoke. Because believe it or not, it's kind of difficult doing these videos. It's not the most natural thing, especially if you kind of feel like, you know, it's unlikely that you're gonna say something people actually want to hear. It's very difficult to do videos. So when you see a lot of these YouTubers that can just fire it off, it's actually really impressive. You know, anyways, that's a, that's a whole different video. Um, but if you have staff or you have a project that is waiting on you to get video, it is really expensive if something stops working. So have plenty of batteries. Uh, that's going to save you a lot of headache. Continuing with the theme, tripods. That's one that a lot of people don't put a lot of consideration to. Not just tripods, but tripod or the heads. The head is going to be the mounting unit that goes from the tripod to the camera itself. So the tripod I'm shooting this on is called a Zome. Zomi. It's a Chinese made full carbon fiber tripod. Um, and um, it's been pretty good. It wasn't super cheap, but it also wasn't the most expensive for that specific tripod. Um, for what I use it for, it actually has hit the mark for me. Um, the ball head that I have, and I'll have some links to some ball heads for you to use to purchase potentially. Um, the only complaint I have with that ball head is, uh, for instance, We'll, we'll view this as a, as a mini ball head, okay? So why is it called a ball head? Well, there's a ball and a socket. So it's a ball head. Um, the one right here, and I'll have a link to this one if you wanna get it. It functionally, it's been great. There's only one complaint I have, and that's when I grab it, because it can actually, the, the whole unit, now this one, when I tighten it down, it everything locks down, but there's actually two different pieces. There's the, the actual mount, which can swivel like such, and then this base right here, when it's loose, it can spin. 
on this axis. You can see these tick marks, hopefully. So I can spin on the axis. Well, this one, it's great, but when you grab it like so, and it's, it's probably three times bigger than this one. When you grab it like the, this to spin it, there's a little bit of grease that was packed in there, and you'll get a little smudge of grease on your hand. So um, that can be quite frustrating. Uh, honestly, I don't know if that's common, though. That might be something that's on most ball heads and just something that I'm a little, uh, what's the word I could find? It's a little OCD about that kind of stuff, I suppose. But um, you have tripods that have, primarily there are two different types of mechanism that's going to extend the legs. One is a spinning style. Um, let's see here. I say that, I don't have my, my brother's tripod here. I would say uh, three styles, I'm sorry. There's one that, that, there's a spinning lock that goes all the way around the base leg. There's ones that have clips that you flip, you loosen it and it slides up and down and then you tighten it back down. And then you have another spinning style like we find on this tripod that has the locking mechanism, it spins, but it's on the outside. It, it doesn't encompass the whole uh, leg. Different folks, different strokes. Everybody, everybody likes their own thing. Uh, I kind of, my favorite right now is one that has uh, a flip arm on it because when you've got a camera on it and you're moving it around, and let's say you're trying to get some quick shots, it can be frustrating to spin and then grab a leg and have to pull it down and push it up. And I feel like sometimes it'd be easier to just flip it and slide up and slide down. Um, so again, different folks, different strokes. So when we come back, I'm gonna talk about one of the aspects of video work that um, is going to help you with the actual production day shoot and you'll see it when you go to put it on a computer screen so I'll be back in just one second all right so yeah it's nice to have staff here to help you out because <laughs> every little thing takes forever when you shoot by yourself so I was talking about let's see here uh, what's something you can do that's going to help you out with your production quality that you may not realize until you're actually doing your post work or work on the computer after you've shut everything. And that's the use of a field monitor. So a field monitor is a means for you to have basically a TV screen for your camera. Because you can't always see on either the LCD, live views, or uh, God forbid you have to use um, the eyepiece to shoot video, that would be, ugh. Anyways, your field monitor can mount up with a C-clamp or they have all different types of mounting mechanisms. We primarily use this when we're using our slider and when we're using the gimbal, the three-axis gimbal. And this can mount up to the gimbal just like so. It uses a an HDMI cable which then connects to my camera and I can watch on a much larger screen that's much more vibrant and easy to see in say dot, uh, sunlight I can see better what I'm shooting what's really cool is you can have monitors that will show you what's in focus um, which also tells you what's not in focus because as you shoot video it can be really difficult to shoot uh, say you're shooting a hood and you think it's in focus and you're like yeah this is gonna be a great shot you know and I've had I've had more out of focus shots than in focus shots when you see a video that's four minutes long five minutes long I had to shoot gosh, 20 30 gigabytes of video in 1080p, like a lot of video, to find just a handful that I feel like is good enough to make the cut, so to speak. 
and a lot of those are disqualified due to poor lighting and being out of focus. Your live view can help you with your being out of focus big time. Moving on, when it comes to stabilizing your camera, that's really important. If you're set up on a tripod, it's not too difficult. As long as you're not uh, dealing with an earthquake or you didn't tighten down your, your um, locking mechanisms enough, the camera's not going to move. You're going to be good. It's when you're doing a moving shot that it can be really difficult to get some steady shots. This was the first stabilizer that I got. It's called a Velo VB1000 Action Pan. Uh, and basically what you do is you connect your camera to the base here and it gives you something that you can move by hand that's much more steady than this. Is it a lot more steady? In my experience, no. But if you don't have more money for better equipment, I'm going to show you some other pieces too. Um, this isn't bad. It's going to be. It's still going to be better than trying to shoot by hand. Uh, and if you have image stabilization as well, you can get some usable shots. We do have some videos where some of the video was shot on this. I'm not going to tell you what they are because, again, it just drives me crazy when I see it and know it could have been better. Um, but you see, I've still got it around. I'm still keeping it. Um, maybe, I mean, it's covered with dust because, I, I, you know, for me, if I'm going to hook something up and I'm going to shoot video, you know, why not do it the right way the first time? Attempt to. The next step up would be one of these guys. And this is a, technically it's referred to as a uh, steady cam. And what it's going to be is uh, you've got a lot of adjustments to make on this mug right here. You've got the head in which you're going to mount your camera. You've got your handle here, which is basically got two swivel points, one this way, one this way. Um, and then you have your base plate, which you're going to hook weights up to. This thing can be a beast to set up properly because what tends to happen, um, and if you read the reviews, you'll see that I'm not alone on this. These can be very difficult to set up because every time you adjust one aspect, say you add weight to one side or the other or both sides, Things up here change, and then you, you adjust one of these plates so that, and these plates, how they adjust is like so. They can adjust left and right. Let's see here. I think that's primarily how it's adjusted. Um, yeah, it's been a very long time since I messed with this thing. I really don't like it. Yep, there we go. Um, I used it a couple times, and then I set it in the corner but I shoot with a lot of different lenses. If you were to shoot with one lens, it, it wouldn't be too terrible. You'd set it up and you'd leave it set up. But again, any minor adjustment throws all of it out of whack. And it's not motorized. So you have to counterbalance. Everything that you do, you have to counter it in some way. So to the extent um, let's say, let's say you have your, your focus where you want it. Let's say you're shooting a prime lens, uh, 35 millimeter. That's all it is. So you can't, you can't adjust the lens, the body to move out. As soon as you, as soon as you adjust the focus, the internal mechanism moves just a little bit. It can turn the whole thing. So it's now shooting video crooked. So these can be very difficult to manage, um, but they still come in way less expensive than a three-axis gimbal. The next step up is going to be your three-axis gimbal. If you've got a larger camera, um, so for the sake of showing off the three-axis gimbal, because I've got my D810 I'm shooting on, um, 
I set up my iOS M on here. And I'm going to show you how quick it is to take it from being out of balance. So here we can see that it is completely out of balance because even when you turn it on and the motors are running, if it's sitting like this, then the motors will get it right upright, but the, you're going to burn your motors out. So you still want it to be balanced when you start. But I'm going to show you how quickly you can set these up to be in balance. Uh, anyways, with a three axis gimbal, you're going to have the ultimate instability. Uh, and I'll show you why. So what I'm going to do here is quickly demonstrate how to get this thing balanced. And the reason it's important to see how easy these are to balance is because you're going to be balancing it fairly often, unless you're shooting with the exact same lens every time and the exact same focus, um, you know, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> you're going to have a bad time. Bingo, that's pretty much it. It's pretty much focused, uh, balanced here. So um, then you can turn it on. See where the battery is on this guy. Again, I wasn't really anticipating filming today, but hey, I had downtime. Okay, so you can't hear it running likely, but your three axis gimbal, I mean, it's gonna be smooth. The video you shoot on this thing, now the, 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 the way it will not be smooth is like this. Unless there are body mounts and now you're getting into a realm of expense, which is extraordinary. But they have mounts that come over and it's suspension even for this. So let's say you were a professional production company and you needed a guy that could literally run full speed with the camera and keep it super smooth. I mean, basically all he'd have to do is make sure it doesn't turn with his hands and he could run wide open. But we get a lot of shots with this. Um, if you look at, we did a 964 Turbo. Um, if you go and look at that video, there's a shot where we come along the ground and then I think we roll past. Most of that video, if not all of it, was shot with this gimbal. So you can take it and preload it to be looking up, just like so. And then let's say this is the ground, and then you can just move along the ground. And you see how smooth that is? You will never be able to do that by hand. Now, when I bought this, and this is called the Ronin M, if I remember correctly. See here, yes, the Ronin M. I think when I bought this, it was about fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars $1,600. I think you can have them for about a thousand bucks now. Um, they're awesome. They're awesome. If you've got the keys for it and you're serious about video, you need to get one. Um, there's no substitute for that. In terms of a full-size camera. Now, if you've got a smaller camera you're working with, um, they make smaller gimbals that are going to be less expensive. So this would be an example of that, is a DJI Osmo. Osmo Mobile? And that's what this is. Yes, it's the Osmo. And um, what you can do with this is you can use it for your phone. And again, these are great. I shoot all of my video for Instagram on this now. And I can tell you what, I'm going to take the video. I shoot with this. Oh my gosh, it's so ugly over there. Anyways, I'll shoot some video and show you exactly what I'm talking about with how this thing works and how good it works. I'm going to turn on the DJI Go app. And once that's on, oops, let's turn on Bluetooth. You can tell I really prepared for this tonight. 
like I said, I did not anticipate this, but hopefully you get some value from it. If you don't, I apologize for wasting your time. Whoops. Let's do this. All right, and then turn it on. Okay, so it's firing up the DJI Go app. There it goes. And what the DJI Go app does, it connects via Bluetooth. Um, so you can start your video. You can take pictures. You can manually operate the gimbal with the thumb drive. And what's really cool about this, let's say you get really far off of center. You can double tap that back pulls you straight back to where it is. So, this is you, and I'll tell you what, we've got an opportunity here. Here's some of the gear we've reviewed. So, this is the receiver right here. This is what I was talking about, the spin lock. Not really crazy about it, because it takes essentially two hands, whereas with the thumb flip, it's like this. Um, and I guess technically you could spin this with one hand, but you lose your stability. And you also, um, if you don't completely loosen it, which sometimes means you spin it a, a couple times, you can't freely move the leg. So again, the thumb uh, mover lock, locking mechanism is kind of the way to go. You see here? It's like a dream within a dream. So this right here means I'm gonna have to take a break. I'll be right back and what we're gonna cover is how can we get some great video uh, pretty inexpensively, some nice, um, uh, some nice smooth shots and it won't cost an arm and a leg. I'll tell you guys here in a minute. The last thing we're going to review um, for mounting systems is going to be the slider. So the slider is as exactly as it says. It's a means to mount a camera. And in this case, remember I was talking about the ball head? Um, most of your equipment, you're going to have to purchase a ball head or a, a head for the piece of equipment. Uh, in this case, this is an XC source ball head. Uh, it's worked very well for me. I've been very satisfied. Um, and what you're going to do is mount your camera, and it's a means to get a nice, smooth shot. Now you can shoot lateral to your target. You can set it up at an angle so that, uh, of course, you would want it to be firmly mounted. Let's say you wanted to get a shot doing this. You can do that. Let's say, uh, and we, this, I do this with all of my videos. Uh, I don't use all of it, but, uh, and this is the benefit to a ball head, is you can take it and actually level out the camera, just like so. It would be level like that. And then let's say you wanted to get a shot moving vertically as well. You can do that. Uh, as long as the camera is aimed high enough, you could get a shot going directly at your target. You can get a shot coming directly away. Uh, I use this slider more than I use any other implement when shooting video. As a matter of fact, I keep this slider mounted to this tripod and you need a very hefty tripod when you have a a slider because it is not a light piece of equipment um, but I keep it mounted to this tripod it literally sits in the corner waiting to be used Just like so. And 
when I was talking about ease of use for a tripod. Um, I do like these locking mechanisms because you can essentially use them with one hand. It just means you have to lift up with the other. Let's say you have it set as low as possible and you've got it you know, at whatever angle you're going to have your slider at. But let's say you want to change the shot you have. You may just loosen all of them. And uh, well, I would only loosen all of them if I wanted to go all the way up or all the way down. But so I'm going to lock these top ones because I know what's coming. It's going to go beyond me because I'm such a tall person. But you could pull it up with one hand lock and then you can take it and put the weight on this one and it, the other sides hold up good enough. Because this is, that's common. What I just did there is really common. Because when you're working around a car, sometimes I have somebody assisting me. And if somebody's with me, that's great. But I like to keep my guys on the projects so we can stay profitable. Because <laughs> it's not profitable when I'm out, you know. Yes, we get leads, uh, videos uh, help us with our marketing. But it doesn't directly... Like, I can't go to, to somebody we owe money to and say, hey, you know, how about you take this shot in exchange for whatever it is that I paid you for, ordered from you. It just doesn't work. So I have to keep my guys on, on the money, on the projects. So what I like to do is, if at all possible, have equipment that allows me to work by myself. Now, that's not always possible, and there's countless hours where I shoot with one and sometimes two assistants. I've had upwards of three assistants with me if we're doing video and we've got a lot of stuff happening around. That can be necessary. Uh, the nice thing about a tripod like this as well is if you say, well, tripod only goes so low, I want to take my camera off and I want to be able to work with just the slider. It's that quick. These things are awesome. I have to say it's my favorite. These are my favorite tools and it's only a few hundred dollars to get them between you can get a dirt cheap head, you can get an expensive head, whatever. Um, but these are incredible. They're awesome. If you're serious about your video, get one if not more of them. They make them in different lengths. So, uh, finally, and I'm just going to touch on this for, <laughs> I say a few minutes, the video is probably already 30 minutes long, but we just got a new toy and I've been able to play with it for a little bit and I absolutely love this thing. It is awesome. What do we have here? So let me preface this by saying We've got all the ground shots we could possibly want pretty much here. Uh, what we haven't had is the ability to shoot from the air. Now, the great thing with a, a drone is you don't have to use it like you're getting overhead shots. You can have that sucker hover just off the ground. Um, and I have not shot and produced any videos with this yet. But I have played with it, and you'd better believe we're gonna have some really awesome stuff coming out here very soon. So this is the DJI Inspire 2. Uh, first of all, thank you to Josh Nickel um, of Nickel's Rental. He's a client of mine. Um, all I can say is that uh, where I was considering a drone. He came in and after consultation said he wanted us to do his Tesla and we did a satin full body paint. He did a full Monty satin style. Uh, full, full Monty uh, satin style with Modesta, PPF, all that stuff. And he said, Jean-Claude, I've seen your videos. You're taking my Mavic Pro and you're going to play with it because I know you're going to buy one. And actually he, he was the one that at the same time, he said, you're going to take my Osmo also. So 
I was on the verge of getting an Osmo at the time, and uh, I couldn't get the Osmo. It was out of stock the moment that I wanted it, so I ordered some Chinese thing from uh, Amazon. I'll tell you, I used it for a day. It didn't work well with the app, and the moment I spend money on something and it doesn't work right, and clearly it was just gross neglect that they didn't put it together properly to work with the uh, software. I get aggravated, I'm like, take this thing back, I don't want it, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to wait for the better item. So I'm glad I returned it, I got the Osmo, I've been very happy. Thank you Josh um, for tipping me over the edge. Um, though my account is not thanking you for tipping me over the edge to spend money on a drone because it, the Mavic Pro is a sweet piece of equipment. Right now it's about a thousand bucks to get one. Very, very smart piece of equipment. I had been flying a really tiny drone that I got for my son Jack and believe it or not that thing is very difficult to fly. It has no assistance at all. Uh, the, it's so small, I mean, you think of a, um, like a car like an S2000, like the, it's just, it's like a go-kart, it's so twitchy. If you've ever driven one at, you know, 120 miles an hour, not that I have, but uh, yes, I have. Anyways, um, it's really twitchy, right? Piece of equipment like this is not twitchy at all. Um, the Mavic Pro was very easy to fly. Um, because I had gotten used to flying on that smaller drone um, that had no assistance, I felt very comfortable once I got the Mavic Pro in my hands. And I started doing research, and I was considering, do I get the Mavic Pro? Do I get the Phantom 4 Pro, Phantom Pro 4? Um, do I go on and cough up, you know, what's big bucks for me for an Inspire 2? Well, I am the type that when I... You know, I tell my clients, I'm, I'm just like you, it scales down for me. But when I get things, I just want to make sure that what I get, I'm going to be happy with and I'm not going to have buyer's remorse. And it's been very, I can't think of a time I got what I really wanted and I waited until I could comfortably afford it that I got it and had buyer's remorse. But every time I've ever had buyer's remorse, it's been because I got what I cheaped out and I didn't get what I knew I was really gonna be happy with. Which is funny, because that's kind of the model that I follow with my businesses. We try to be that solution that, you know, it, you know, it's one of those things, you get what you pay for, and we put a lot of time and energy into the things we do, but it's because I do it like I was doing it for myself. So this is kind of the same thing. Um, I could have spent $1,000 on the Mavic Pro, uh, nice piece of equipment, but what I felt like is it didn't give me the flexibility that I needed for um, for my video editing to make sure that the colors are natural and uh, sometimes we work in less than ideal lighting conditions and that's huge for me. Like I was talking about before, when things don't work, that's when things get really expensive and it goes from... Um, it goes from, hey, we can make this work to now we completely wasted our time. I wasted my time. So the Mavic Pro for, for what I was looking for, uh, I still may end up getting one just for like family vacations and travel and stuff. Uh, just because as you can see, this comes in a huge carrying case. It's a very large piece of equipment. Um, the next one I considered was the Mavic 4 Pro, Mavic Pro 4. Um, better quality video, but it did not have interchangeable lenses. So I was stuck with the lens that came on it, and I need more flexibility. So I continued to come back to this, um, to the Inspire 2, and essentially... I had to just commit to uh, this is what we really I think is going to be the best fit for our business. Not just that, but it has sensors on the top, it has sensors on the bottom, it has sensors on the front, so you're far less likely to hit something and cause any kind of damage. And when it comes to a piece of equipment like this, any damage is very expensive. 
so this is kind of like the drone version of starting to get into professional photography gear. You feel like you get nickel and dime to death. Um, the gimbal itself was, uh, gimbal, I'm sorry, the drone itself, the base drone with the controller, two batteries, which two batteries, functionally, it's like one battery. Don't think of it as two because you can't fly it with just one. You have to have two. And when you change them out, you should be changing them out in sets. So um, two batteries, the battery charging station, uh, no camera except for the point of view camera here on the front, which you're not going to shoot, you're not going to actively shoot video with. What you're going to shoot video with is the gimbal that you hook up on the bottom here. You can see there's that um, quick connect here. How that works is you need to buy a gimbal. Now with the Inspire 2 you have three options for your gimbal. You have uh, the, the, what's it called, Zen, Zen Muse X4, it might be X3, but I think it's the X4 for the Inspire 2. Um, now that's got the exact same gimbal and camera as the Mavic Pro 4. So it's a high quality gimbal and camera, but it's not interchangeable. The next one up is the Zen Muse X5S, which is what I got. The next step up is the X7. So it's a nice jump from the X4 to the X5S, and then it's a nice jump from the X5S to the X7. Now, the thing that kind of irks me a little bit is you don't have interchangeable lenses between the X5S and X7. In the X7, you can only purchase proprietary lenses, and their lenses are really expensive. So each one of the lenses, if I remember offhand, was about $1,200. Um, with the X7, you do not get a lens with the camera and gimbal. So I'll quickly go over how fast this thing can get expensive. Um, if you get the, the base Inspire 2, it's $3,000. You're going to spend $3,000 just for the base. You're going to have the blades, the propellers, you're going to have the controller. You're going to have two batteries, which has fly time with a gimbal hooked up of, I think it's 20 to 25 minutes. Um, and basically, that's bare bones. You're not going to be able to shoot video. Um, if you get the X4 gimbal in, in camera, I think it's, uh, it's hundreds of dollars. It's like $600, $500, something like that. To get the X5S, if I remember right, it was about $1,800 and it comes with one lens on it. It comes with the, what is this lens? It's a 15 millimeter lens, uh, F 1.7 15 millimeter lens. Each one of the lenses beyond that, you can use um, Olympus four thirds lenses which are very affordable. From a few hundred dollars a piece to, you can get really nice ones for over a thousand. Um, but this gave me the variety of lenses. First of all, it has a, a better variety of lenses than the X7 has, but it's also um, baseline to get in the X4, X5S, and the X7. Absolute baseline, it's $3,000 more to go to the X7. And then each one of your lenses is going to be much, much more expensive moving forward. Now the nice thing is, if they, if the X7 starts looking more appealing, I can always sell my X5S with the lenses and there's very likely to be a demand for it. Um, same could be said of the X7, but uh, outfitted the way I have it now, it was about, it was right at $8,000. And that was still a lot of money, but 
I did not feel like $11,000, I couldn't justify $11,000 for where I am with my video. That can change, but you know, you gotta, like I said, you gotta choose your battles, right? So uh, to get this mounted up, it's very nice. There's, I don't have a fear that the lens, the gimbal is ever going to fall off and I'll show you why. Uh, first, I need to get two batteries in it. So as you can, as you can see the, right now, the gimbal, I'm sorry, the, the drone is sitting low. This is in travel mode, so it can be packed away. To take it out of travel mode, you have these nice little covers for the batteries. I love things like that because I'm, I'm OCD when it comes to when I see exposed prongs. I, I just want them covered up. You know, as expensive as this thing is, I don't, I can't stand the idea of something bends it. And then now I've got the world's most expensive um, paperweight. So get the batteries in and press the button five times. One, two, three, four, five. And it should lift up. So, and actually it turned on. So, um, take your hood off of the quick connect. And the reason I don't feel like I have to sweat this thing coming off is because, let me figure this thing in here. Well, the, uh, it turns out the battery died. Not the battery, but the, uh, the camera can only run 20 minutes of video at a time. So that's really awesome because I rambled on for probably another 20 minutes. So I'll give you guys the Cliff Notes version of this thing. The camera where it died off, I was talking about the Quick Connect here. There's a button. Uh, the only way that button's going to uh, compress and your, your gimbal's going to fall off is if you've got a catastrophic failure. You've already crashed this thing and something's hit in there. You're ju it's just not going to happen otherwise. Uh, some of the things that make this so expensive is if you want to record in anything except for 4K, um, you need one of these. It's called a DJI Cine SSD. This is a 480 gigabyte solid state drive. It's proprietary in how it connects, and it's about $1,000. Um, yeah, I'm not super happy about that. But this camera will shoot in 5.2K RAW, which, again, I like the adjustability that, that um, well, I didn't really touch on shooting in RAW. But when you're shooting your camera and you're shooting manual, you may want to shoot in RAW. Read up on that. But basically, it's going to give you, on the software side, um, when you're going in and making sure, like, say, your blacks aren't too black and you can actually see details in like the grill areas and the wheel areas of cars. Shooting in RAW gives you the ability to lighten those shadows and see the stuff that your eye couldn't see but the camera saw. Uh, video is the same way. Now to get the information from your Cine SSD, you have to have this. It's called a Cine SSD station. It plugs in. It's got a proprietary connection that goes to USB, your USB port on your computer, and you can only read. This is read only. What that means is you can only pull information off of this SSD and put it on your computer. You cannot erase from your computer. If you want to erase anything on here, you have to erase all of it through the drone. You know what, this is like the, this is the SSD version of a USB plug. I found that out. Unless you're looking and you see exactly where the rails go, you'll never, the first time you go to plug it in, you'll never plug it in right. You ever notice that with a USB if you're not looking at it? It's, it will, ne has anybody in the hi history of man, have they ever plugged in a USB the first time without, right, without looking at it? I don't think so. Anyways. Um, to erase... You have to format the hard drive. That's right, you have to erase everything on the hard drive. So it's like you either download it, 
one or all of it, or you erase all of it. But you can't do it from this in the same media format. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not right. Not the same media format, but the same format. So you can only erase when it's in the gimbal from the app by formatting, and you can only pull files off through this $200 or $300 thing. So that part is kind of aggravating for me. I don't like that because there's only one reason they did it that way. Well, two. The first is this, and the second, I think, is they're just laughing at people, being aggravated. Somebody's just being mean to do that. It's a terrible idea. So anyways, um, this is that's part of the reason this thing gets so expensive is uh, everything about it, there's nothing about this that isn't expensive. Um, but it is really good at what it does. And it's one of those cases where if you want to play, you got to pay. Um, the only way to shoot 5.2K or shoot in raw format is through Cinema DNG or Apple ProRes. Now those are, essentially those are pieces of software that um, they're like, uh, how can I put it? This is kind of getting beyond me a little bit, but uh, it's software that basically um, computes the information. So it's like a proprietary video software. Uh, because it's it's gathering information a certain way, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a thousand dollars to get the key to activate it for the drone, and it lives with the drone. It never goes. You can never use it on another piece of equipment. It can only be used on this. So when I talk about this relatively basic setup is about $8,000, it's really easy for somebody to spend $20,000 on an Inspire 2 that's maxed out. It gets very expensive. Anyways, I'm kind of one of those guys that if I'm going to do it, I want to do it right. So if I'm going to get a drone and I'm going to shoot drone video, I want all the sensors that are going to afford me all the peace of mind I can have. It gives me the least amount of risk. Um, it's built, essentially. Uh, it's a prosumer, a high-end prosumer piece of equipment. It's not built um, primarily for the hobbyist. It's built primarily for somebody who's looking for something that's, you know, got a bit more refinement to their, uh, looking for a bit more refinement to their video, higher quality. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into the caliber of the camera system, but the jumps are well worth it. Uh, even to the X7, it's just I had to cut off the spending somewhere, and I cut it off at about $8,000. So um, the time may come when I get an X7 camera and their crazy expensive lenses, um, which is funny because if I get a $1,200 lens for my DSLR, that's not that big of a, well, I want to say like $1,200 bucks is not a lot of money, but that's not unheard of. But to get a proprietary little lens that's only good for the X7 on this specific drone, that kind of gets into a realm of a little crazy for me. Uh, that's why I didn't get it. But anyways, we will be having some video come out with shooting the... Inspire 2 and the X7 RS, whatever that thing is. Um, in the meantime, I hope this video hasn't been too terribly boring for you. Uh, I know sometimes I can be a little monotone, and I'm working on that. So I've got some some decent equipment, and I've been shooting a lot of video, uh, or you know, a bit of video, and I'm working on having a better camera presence. I hope that it's a little better for you guys. Um, but if you enjoy the video, you enjoy our content, please subscribe, uh, like, share, all that stuff. Uh, it helps give us some exposure and uh, rewards us for our hard work. Um, if you don't like it, feel free to tell me in the comments how terrible it is and how you know things so much better. You know, that's awesome. That's great. You know, please share. The world wants to know what you think. You know, why make a video when you can 
leave it in the comment section. You know, that's so much easier, right? Reading between the lines there, picking up on that. Anyways, thanks for watching the video. Uh, we've got those affiliate links. Feel free to buy, uh, buy your stuff through them. It sends us a couple bucks. Um, and keeps us making some videos and hopefully they keep getting better for you. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section below uh, and I'll do the best I can to answer. And if I'm not able to get to it in time, no doubt somebody that knows everything in the world will be able to get to it first. Until next time, folks. See you around.